In the summer of 1984, San Francisco is gripped by fear. Neighbors, family, and friends are vanishing without a trace. Police are perplexed. The investigation takes a deadly turn when a killing field is uncovered high in the California mountains. As the body count climbs, the evidence points to an elusive killer. To bring this murderer to justice, a small town prosecutor must take a long, dark journey into the mind of a serial killer. On the morning of October 26, 1998, the longest and most expensive criminal trial in California history got underway. With an investigation spanning 13 years and a case file weighing over two tons, the burden of prosecuting one of California's most notorious killers would fall on Peter Smith, the district attorney of Calaveras County. A prosecutor's job is to seek justice. I think many people look at prosecutors and, and think their job is to, to convict and pe put people in, in jail or prison, and that's part of the job, too. But it really is our responsibility to make sure the justice system, um, particularly the criminal justice system, is, uh, is uh, carried out fairly uh, to the point where justice is always sought. On June 2nd, 1985, a South San Francisco dispatch operator received a call. A theft was in progress at South City Lumber. 31 Boy 1, 1087 Robert 1 at South City Lumber, Railroad and Spruce on a 488 shoplifting. Officer Daniel Wright of the South San Francisco Police Department responded to the call. I had just one year on the street at that time, and, uh, you know, my thoughts were, you know, officer safety, be careful. Like any call you go to, things could go awry at any time. A witness told Wright he had seen an Asian male stealing a $75 table vice. He said the thief, when confronted, tossed the vice into the trunk of a brown Honda and fled on foot. Inside the Honda, Wright spotted a suspicious looking case. I opened up the case and found a 22 Ruger with a uh, cylinder shape object that was probably six to nine inches long. And through my training, I observed it to be a, uh, a silencer. The gun was illegally modified. As Wright took a closer look, an agitated man burst from the store. He told the officer he paid for the vice his friend had taken. Wright's supervisor, Sergeant Paul Zemer, arrived on the scene. The gun in the Honda made both officers suspicious. The car was impounded. At that time, we told him that he was going to be going down to the station to give a statement about the weapon. And uh, he was handcuffed and placed into uh, Officer Zemer's vehicle and brought to our station. On the way to the station, the man told Zemer the shoplifter's name was Charles Ng. Dispatch, I got an ID on that Asian The officer used his radio to request a background check on Ng. Golf. They got a hit. Ng was a former Marine, born in Hong Kong. He'd been convicted in military court for stealing automatic weapons from a military base in Hawaii. He had once escaped from a military prison. At the South San Francisco Police Station, the subject was placed in a secure holding room. He told the officer his name was Leonard Lake. He said he was a fugitive from justice and offered to make a statement. But first, he wanted a piece of paper, a pencil, and a glass of water. Write your statement. I'll be back in a few minutes. Zemer left the room to summon Gary Hopper, the on-call detective that Sunday. When they returned, 
Blake was on the floor convulsing wildly. Detective Hopper called the paramedics. He was flopping around on the floor. It was very violent, uh, like a fish flapping out of water, and, uh, uncontrollable. But we had no idea what was happening at the time, whether it was like an epileptic seizure or just what was going on. Detective Hopper called the paramedics. Once the, the paramedics got into the emergency hospital, we found out uh, a little later that uh, there was, they were fighting no activity at all in his brain, that he was uh, apparently brain dead. An autopsy later revealed that Lake had ingested capsules containing cyanide. The doctor told me and the lab technicians told me that uh, it took about 20 to 25 minutes for the gel cap to dissolve before the cyanide actually hit his system and that that would probably coincide fairly well with the amount of time between he was at the lumber yard and brought to the, the police station. Rather than writing a statement, Blake had written a note to a woman named Lynn. The note read, Dear Lynn, I love you. I forgive you. Freedom is better than all else. I'm sorry, Mom, Patty, and all. I'm sorry for all the trouble. Love, Leonard. Police were perplexed. Why had the suspect taken his own life? Whatever secrets Leonard Lake held, he took to the grave. The answer might lie with Lake's companion, Charles Ng. Police issued a warrant for Ng's arrest for shoplifting. Then they processed the car Lake had been driving. When they ran the serial number on the Honda's engine block, Investigators discovered that the car belonged to Paul Cosner. Cosner, a Bay Area resident, had been missing for seven months. Hello? Detective Irene Brunn of the San Francisco Police Department investigated Hello? Cosner's disappearance. Cosner's sister had reported him missing months earlier. I'll be in a half hour. And she was quite distraught. Her brother had disappeared. He had had a date that evening with his girlfriend for dinner, who also lived in the same apartment building where he lived. He failed to show up for that dinner date, and in speaking to the girlfriend, uh, Paul was going to show a car that he was selling through an advertisement in the paper. Cosner was only one of many strange cases involving missing persons in the Bay Area. Detective Brunn was also investigating the disappearance of an entire family. On July 25, 1984, San Francisco police responded to a frantic call for help. Harvey Dubbs, his wife and their 16-month-old son, Sean, hadn't been seen for several days. Police had to climb through a window to gain access to the Dubbs apartment. The Dubbs family had indeed disappeared and the signs of a struggle were apparent. Days earlier, Harvey Dubbs had placed an ad in the newspaper to rent out his video equipment. That equipment was now missing. Missing person cases usually fit a certain profile. They often involve teenage runaways or people who disappear without telling anyone, only to return a few days later. In the case of the Dubs, it was clear the family hadn't left voluntarily. Detective Brunn feared they would never return. In the house, there were things that were unusual and out of order. The baby's room was out of order. Deborah's medication was left at home, and it was something she had to take every day. Um, so there were a lot of things that were just didn't look right. They left their cats locked in the house unattended, and they wouldn't have done that. It is unusual for people like Paul Cosner or the Dubs family to simply vanish without a trace. Leads, both cases had gone cold. To be realistic, we get 500 a month. We had one family disappeared July 25th. Now that now we're up to November 2nd. So because of the caseload, you know, you're not trying to pin cases together. The only similarity was a newspaper ad. 
Based on the discovery of Paul Cosner's brown Honda, Brunn and her partner reopened his case and searched the vehicle for clues. They found a driver's license belonging to a man named Scott Stately. They found a stun gun and several unspent bullets on the floor of the car. A recent electric bill addressed to an unknown woman named Clarilyn Balaz was found under the passenger seat. And in the roof of the car, investigators found a single bullet hole. Can you see that front there, partner? The trajectory of the bullet indicated the shot was fired from the back seat. The investigators sprayed luminol around the interior of the vehicle. Luminol reacts with proteins in blood, making even traces of blood fluoresce. High-velocity blood spatter associated with a gunshot wound appeared on the roof next to the front passenger seat. Brunn and her partner now suspected they would never find Cosner alive. With Leonard Lake dead and his partner Charles Ng at large, investigators could only wonder how many more victims they might find at the end of this trail of blood. Leonard Lake's mysterious suicide had now launched a full-scale police investigation. Brunn and her partner drove to the home of Leonard Lake's mother, who lived about an hour outside of San Francisco. Hi, ma'am. I'm Detective Tom Eisenman with the police department. This At the house, they were surprised to find Clara Lynn Balaz, the woman whose name like appeared on the electric bill found in Cosner's car. Okay, ma'am. Clara Lynn Balaz was Lake's ex-wife. They had been married for three years, but divorced a year earlier. It's been a long drive up. Detectives suspected she might be the woman Lake addressed in his suicide note. They asked Balaz how an electric bill in her name wound up in Paul Cosner's car. Balaz explained the address on the bill was for a cabin her family owned in Calaveras County in Northern California. Although Brunn and her partner were eager to search the cabin, Balaz claimed she was too busy to take them there until the next day. The detectives postponed their search until the following morning and instructed Balaz not to visit the property in the meantime. So we called the uh, Calaveras Sheriff's Department and told them that we were going to be coming up the following morning and why we were going and if it was possible for them to have somebody keep an eye on the property. Calaveras County covers over 1,100 square miles of wild terrain. A force of 34 officers protected the entire county in 1985. There hadn't been need for more. The sheriff sent two deputies to watch the cabin, which was located outside the town of Wilseyville. A metal gate prevented them from driving onto the property. Because of their manpower shortage, they couldn't have somebody sit there for the next 24 hours, but they would make passing calls, which was reasonable. The following morning, Brunn and her partner arranged to meet Clara Lynn Balaz outside the Wilseyville post office. They were surprised when she arrived with Lake's mother. And at that point, Carolyn admitted that they had driven up the night before. And um, the pretext was that Leonard was very untidy and they wanted to tidy up the cabin. Concerned that Balaz and Lake's mother might have compromised evidence at the cabin, Brunn, her partner, and the Calaveras County sheriffs followed them to the property. The detectives asked Balaz about a cinder block bunker near the cabin. She said she didn't have the key and would not give them permission to search it. Lacking sufficient probable cause for a warrant, the detectives would have to limit their search to the cabin alone. But at this point we were still more interested in getting into the house so we didn't want to antagonize her. Um, because this was a consent search. Other than that, we would have had to stop and go get a search warrant at that point.
While her partner questioned Balaz, Detective Brun searched the house. I came up last night just for a few minutes. She noticed something odd about the bed. There were holes drilled into the bedposts and the floor. It seemed designed to tie someone up. And I was standing in front of this bookcase and I happened to turn around and all of a sudden I recognized a piece of equipment. And then it dawns on me where I had seen it. It was the dubs. The video equipment, Brun recalled, had been stolen from the home of Harvey Dubs, the San Francisco man who vanished with his family 11 months earlier. So I went over and called my office. I said, would you mind checking our inventory and read me the serial number? To, he proceeded to start reading the serial number, and then I gave him the last three numbers from the piece of paper that I had in my hand. And so at that point, we realized that now this is even getting bigger. It's not just Mr. Cosner, now we have the dubs. And at that point, Clara Lynn got very nervous and said, you've been here long enough, I want you to leave. To learn what other secrets the isolated cabin held, Detective Brunn would need to obtain a search warrant. The investigators left the property, but this time they made certain the cabin would be secure until they returned. As investigators conducted a search of Leonard Lake's cabin in Calaveras County, they had discovered video equipment that belonged to a family who had been missing for nearly a year. This gave them sufficient probable cause to petition the judge for a warrant. Ron McFall led the investigation for the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office. We did get one that day, and later that afternoon we went back to the residence to conduct a search of the residence and the property and what looked like a, a tool shed at first. The tool shed was a cinder block structure that bordered the driveway. Clarilyn Balaz referred to it as a fallout shelter. Got it. Good, good. Leonard Lake had been a survivalist, and this was his fortress against nuclear holocaust. As the heavy door swung open, investigators could only wonder what they might find inside. And we went into the tool shed and we saw 21 photos of uh, uh, young ladies 18 to 23 years old. And so we were at that point really concerned about who are these females, who are these ladies? Many of the photos were of young girls in various stages of undress. Some were nude. It was unclear who the subjects were or where they had been photographed. Everyone feared the pictures might be trophies, such as those serial killers often keep of their victims. They also found a journal written by Leonard Lake. In it, he wrote of The Collector, a novel about a butterfly collector who captures his ultimate prize, a young girl named Miranda. In his journal, Lake writes, The Collector, has it really been near 20 years I've carried this fantasy? And Miranda, how fitting, my lovely little prisoner of the future. In other entries, Lake referred to a series of operations under the heading of the Miranda Project. The investigators could only speculate as to what this meant, but it seemed ominous. One hundred yards from the bunker, Ron McFall and the other investigators noticed the ground had been scarred by a series of several fires. We noticed at that point approximately seven different burn sites on the property. We decided to look at the burn sites a little further, and we found what we thought may be bone fragments, but we really weren't sure. If the piles of ash did contain human bone fragments, someone had attempted to conceal an unspeakable horror. Now desperate for answers, investigators ran the license plates of a truck parked near the cabin. It belonged to Lonnie Bond, Lake's neighbor. Hello, anybody in the house? 
Bonnie Bond lived with his wife and 18-month-old son in a house about 50 yards from Lake's cabin. Anybody home? Officers walked next door to speak with Bond. Hello? Anybody here? Anybody home? The smell of decayed food thickened the air. The house appeared to have been empty for some time, perhaps months. Although it seemed the occupants departed abruptly, there was no sign of foul play. Another vehicle found on Lake's property belonged to Robin Scott Stapley. Stapley had been missing for some time, and his driver's license was found in Paul Cosner's car. Leonard Lake has used Scott Stapley's driver's license because they were both big fellas, and he had been trying to pass himself off as Scott Stapley. So we're contacting Southern California to see, you know, where is Scott Stapley? And it turns out that he had been living at the co cabin next door, and no one has seen them either. Investigators intensified their search. Cadaver dogs, known for their acute sense of smell, were brought in to help. Authorities now suspected that eight missing people from Northern California were linked to the cabin. If they had been murdered as police feared, perhaps their bodies were buried on the property. Hey, Rick, come here. One of the dogs recovered a piece of bone. The deputies working the scene knew immediately that this was not an animal bone. With the discovery of human remains, what had been a missing persons case now became a homicide investigation. <laughs> Investigators declared Leonard Lake's property a crime scene and assembled a task force to process the cabin and surrounding property. Due to the expanding scope of the case, the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office called in additional help. Specialists from the San Francisco Police Department and the California Department of Justice arrived to help with the investigation. Three days after Leonard Lake's suicide, a convoy of law enforcement vehicles descended on the property. Now that this was a murder investigation, police knew that all material recovered from the site could become vital to the eventual prosecution of the case. Each section of the property was assigned to a specific team. The teams began a thorough search of the two acres surrounding the cabin. In a clearing about a hundred yards from the cabin, officers found a trench with loose dirt. They found the trench had been filled with personal belongings and debris. Hey, Officer Ballard, I got something. Sergeant Larry Copeland, an investigator for the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office, joined in the search for clues. Every button, zipper, jewelry even, everything that was taken out of there was turned over to the evidence officer who took each one and individually photographed each and every piece of it. Um, and we're talking hundreds. Everything excavated from the property was potential evidence. All of the items were collected and sent to the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office. They were meticulously cataloged. Investigators hoped that somewhere in this vast collection of evidence, they would find the clue that would untangle the mysteries hidden on Lake's property. If we, we felt there was any chance of it being used or something that either ourselves or the defense could use, we took it and booked it. Investigators sorted through the survival gear and supplies Lake had stockpiled in his so-called fallout shelter. Lieutenant Ron McFall remembers that during this phase of the search, they made a surprising discovery. There was a secret door inside the bunker. It, it was a false door. You, you really couldn't tell just by looking at it, but there was a shelving units, and after you wiggled 
the shelves. You saw that the, the door actually popped open. Beyond the shelves was a double door leading to a hidden room. Off to the side was another three foot by six foot compartment. The cramped space contained a homemade wood cart, a crude shelf holding some toiletries and a roll of toilet paper. A small hole had been cut into the wall near the ceiling, possibly for ventilation. A typed list of rules was affixed to one wall. They included, I must always be ready to service my master and must never speak unless spoken to. I must always be obedient and never look my master in the eye. From outside, investigators could see into the small room through a two-way mirror. They also noticed that the hinges of the door had been damaged. You'll further notice the hinges are bent from obviously pressure from inside the door pushing out, trying to get the door open, both the top and bottom. Remembering Lake's journal, investigators feared that Lake had acted upon his fantasy of kidnapping and holding captive a human slave. Forensic specialists dusted for fingerprints and latent evidence. They hoped that if Lake had indeed kept a prisoner here, he or she had left behind some clue of their presence. They found nothing. As the search of the property outside the bunker continued, an investigator noticed some loose soil next to the driveway. There, they found a five-gallon plastic paint container. As darkness fell, the task force suspended its search. Inside the cabin, the investigators viewed one of the videotapes they had found buried in the plastic container. They could hardly believe what they were seeing. This case was becoming more frightening with each piece of evidence they uncovered. But nothing could prepare them for what lay ahead. After two days of searching Leonard Lake's cabin, investigators feared more than eight people had been killed and possibly buried on the property. On the second night, the task force moved inside the cabin to view the videotape found buried in a plastic container. The tape depicted two women suffering extreme verbal and psychological abuse at the hands of Leonard Lake and his accomplice, who demanded sexual submission under the threat of violence. We also observed a, an Asian male on the tape, and he had a knife in his hand, and he was cutting the clothing. Uh, this would be the, the blouse, and the top, uh, as well as the bra strap, removing clothes from the, uh, from the female. The Asian male was identified as Charles Ng, the shoplifter Leonard Lake had identified just prior to his suicide. The Homicide Division of the San Francisco Police Department launched a full-scale manhunt for Charles Ng. Investigators started with a search of Ng's San Francisco apartment. They collected some video equipment and a number of videotapes. Everything was tagged as evidence and sent for analysis. San Francisco homicide detective Ed Erdelatz led a task force that investigated the year-old disappearance of the Dubs family. The equipment Lake and Ng had used to videotape their captives had once belonged to Harvey Dubs. Investigators had obtained his uh, California driver's license photo and, and had made up a photo collage, shown it to neighbors and identified him as one of the people uh, coming out of the Dubs' home. One of the Dubs' neighbors told investigators that the night before the family was reported missing, she saw two men leaving their residence. One of the men was carrying a duffel bag. It was dark, but she said she could identify him. The eyewitness's critical identification of Charles Ng gave investigators probable cause to issue an arrest warrant. 
Carolyn Balaz, Leonard Lake's ex-wife, was questioned about her ex-husband's association with Charles Ng. She agreed to talk, but only after her attorney convinced the district attorney's office to grant her immunity from prosecution. Balaz claimed she didn't know anything about the murders. She did tell them that after the shoplifting incident, Ng walked to her house. What kind of trouble are you in? The two drove back to the lumber yard to see if Lake was all right. When they saw him talking to the police, they returned to her house. There they waited, expecting a call from Lake, who was now in police custody. When he didn't call, Clarilyn drove Ng to his apartment. Ng told Clarilyn he had to get out of town. She uh, said that she thought he would probably go to Chicago, that he had mentioned that he would go to Chicago if, uh, if he had to get out of town. And she claims that that was the last that uh, she saw of him. Because Ng was wanted for murder and there was reason to believe he had fled the state, the California investigators asked for assistance from the FBI. In response, the Bureau launched a massive manhunt for Charles Ng. At San Francisco International Airport, agents learned that a passenger fitting Ng's description had boarded a plane to Chicago, traveling under the name Mike Kimoto. In Chicago, agents worked to track Ng's movements. They started with an extensive background check. Investigators learned that Charles Ng was born in Hong Kong and entered the United States on a student visa in 1979. He enlisted in the Marine Corps but was eventually arrested for stealing weapons. He escaped from prison and on the advice of a friend hid out with Leonard Lake and his wife Clarilyn. Ng stayed with Lake and his wife for six months in Philo, California. At the same time, ATF agents were building a case against Lake for possession of illegal firearms. In the spring of 1981, they arrested both Lake and Ng. Lake skipped bail and began his life as a fugitive. Ng was sent back to prison to serve the remainder of his original sentence. Ng was released from prison in 1984 and immediately came back to the San Francisco Bay Area, was picked up at the airport by Clara Lynn Balaz and rejoined his uh, buddy Leonard Lake. Charles Ng was an experienced fugitive with a wide network of friends who could help him. To develop more leads, the FBI placed Ng on their 10 most wanted list. For the time being, agents focused on Ng's friends and acquaintances in the Chicago area. As the investigation into Charles Ng expanded, the body count in Calaveras County continued to climb. Not far from Lake's cabin, investigators unearthed two intact bodies wrapped in sleeping bags. Calaveras County Coroner Terry Parker was on the scene. They were mostly skeletal remains that were wrapped. Uh, couldn't really make out if they were men or, or women uh, because of the, of the time that it, uh, the bodies had been there. Due to the deterioration of the bodies, Parker could make only a cursory examination at the site. It appeared both victims had been gagged and handcuffed. He asked for help from the San Francisco medical examiner. San Francisco has a, a very good forensic department and he was uh, more than happy to come up and assist us. Uh, we removed the bodies and transported them to his office for the forensic work where, where that was done. At autopsy, the San Francisco medical examiner determined both victims were males and that they had been shot to death. Using dental records, he identified the men as Lake's neighbors, Lonnie Bond, and Scott Stapley. In Chicago, the FBI got their first lead. 
they learned that after serving time on the weapons charge, Ng had kept in touch with his former cellmate. A man described how he had driven Ng first to Detroit, then to the border town of Chatham. There, he said, they split up. A witness came forward and told agents that he had seen Ng board a bus in Chatham, bound for Toronto. Agents were aware that Ng's sister lived there. The FBI deployed a surveillance team at her apartment house, but the fugitive never showed. After days of following Ng, the trail grew cold. A suspected serial killer was now roaming free in Canada. As word of the multiple murders spread, the news media descended on the property in Calaveras County. Don Lassiter is a true crime author who wrote a book on the Charles Ng case. And of course the media, when they first heard of this, rushed to the site. And daily the, the uh, media coverage grew. And it, it got coverage all over California and soon all over the United States and certainly even in Canada. Okay, Ron, the investigators the agreed to let the media on the property. They showed them the site and allowed them to videotape some of the evidence they had collected. Up until this point, we've really relied on our imaginations to visualize this story. But today we have pictures, pictures that will probably leave many people with an everlasting image of the horror that occurred at the end of this road. These are some of the bone fragments that have been found, and investigators say there are countless fragments just like those scattered over a third of an acre here. The California Conservation Corps has been recruited to pick up the bones. Most of them worked on their hands and knees, raking the ground with their fingers. Investigators came up with 10 pounds of bones. The local coroner says five bodies have been found here so far. The Calaveras County Sheriff once told me, though, he believes there are as many as 20 victims, though, buried on the property. Investigators were counting on the media exposure to help identify the 21 women depicted in the photographs tacked to the wall of Lake's bunker. We certainly want to know the circumstances of the photos, uh, when they were taken. Uh, we're interested in knowing uh, anything we can about Mr. Lake and Mr. Ng. A telephone hotline was set up by the Calaveras Sheriff's Department, and calls soon began pouring in. Detectives believed Leonard Lake and Charles Ng crossed paths with as many as 25 people who were later reported missing. Property in Calaveras County. Working under San Francisco investigator Ed Erdelatz, the task force tried to piece together any leads that would locate Ng or help identify the growing list of victims. Anybody that had anything to do with either Lake or Ng, we attempted to identify and find out if they were still alive and if they were, what their relationship was. And it was through that process uh, that we began to identify different victims. Members of the task force were sent around with photos of personal belongings found on the property in an effort to identify anyone who had been at the cabin. Relatives and friends of the missing realized their loved ones might be among the dead. There was the Dubs family from San Francisco who placed an ad in the newspaper to rent their video equipment and were never heard from again. Randy Jacobson, a friend of Leonard Lake's, was found buried near a chicken coop behind the cabin. Jeff Gerald, who worked with Ng at a San Francisco moving company, disappeared along with his friend Clifford Paranto, who worked at the same company. Ng's longtime friend Mike Carroll and his girlfriend Kathleen Allen had disappeared. Lake's neighbors were also missing. Lonnie Bond, Brenda Hunter, and their 16-month-old child, Lonnie Jr. Their friend, Robin Scott Stapley, had vanished with them. And finally, Paul Cosner, whose car had originally led investigators on this trail of kidnapping and murder. 
The task force received one bit of good news. Hey, listen up, fellas. We finally caught a break on this one. We were able to ID all these women, and they're all still alive. Finding the girls alive was a relief, but Lake's property still held many mysteries. Agents feared they would never know the complete story of the Calaveras County murders unless they found Charles Ng. After weeks of searching, they still had not located the fugitive. Then on July 6, 1985, a boy riding his bicycle in a Canadian park spotted the perfect place for a play fort. He was surprised to see a man living there. He went to the police and told them he had found a campsite and had seen a man who looked like Charles Ng. The boy recognized him from wanted posters. He led police to the makeshift shelter, only to find that Ng had fled. This is campsite clearing. He's gone. Later that same day, Charles Ng would make the mistake investigators had been waiting for. Ironically, it was the same mistake that started the police investigation a month earlier. A security guard confronted a young Asian male as he slipped stolen merchandise into his knapsack in a Calgary department store. As the security guard struggled with the gunman, he was shot in the hand. Still, he managed to wrestle the weapon from the shooter and hold him until police arrived. Charles Ng was captured and booked on charges of attempted murder, robbery, and possession of a firearm. This is Channel 10 Eyewitness News. Night one. Good evening, Poppy Nightwatch. Charles Ng is in a Canadian jail tonight, and a worldwide manhunt is ended for the crime hey, Ron, come take a look at the news. news of Ng's arrest in Canada reached the sheriff's office in Calaveras County. Ng was captured by security guards in a Calgary department store, but not before he engaged them in a brief gun battle and wounded one of the guards. Ng was quickly subdued by store patrons and was taken into police custody. San Francisco Police Inspector Ed Erdelatz was eager to question the suspect. He flew to Calgary, where Ng was being held in a maximum security prison. And, and we spent uh, quite a few hours with Charles in the detention center in Calgary. And although he did talk with us, most of his responses were one and two word answers, a very little dialogue, and primarily uh, denial. We could have gone into a lot of things uh, had, he, uh, had he been willing to talk to us about those things, but that didn't occur. The murders, Ng claimed, were all the work of Leonard Lake. When pressed, Ng did admit to Erdelatz that he had helped Lake dispose of the bodies of Lonnie Bond and Scott Stapley the day after they were murdered. In Calaveras County, the district attorney's office indicted Ng on 12 counts of first-degree murder, making it possible for the prosecution to seek the death penalty. But Ng's flight to Canada had created a significant obstacle. District attorney Pete Smith explains. There is an extradition treaty between the United States and Canada at the time, and in that extradition treaty, there was a condition that nobody would be extradited from Canada back to the United States who faced the death penalty. There were some exceptions to the treaty, however. Do you think we can work around that? If the district attorney's office could prove to a Canadian court that Ng was guilty of multiple murders, Canada would be required to hand over the suspected killer. Before the extradition hearing could begin, Ng would have to stand trial in Canada on shoplifting and assault charges. In order to delay his extradition, Ng waived his right to a jury trial and asked for a speedier bench trial. He received a four and a half year sentence. Until he completed that sentence, the Calaveras County District Attorney could not initiate the complicated extradition process. 
Even if they could prove their case, they would have to wait over four years before they could begin. While the Calaveras County District Attorney's Office built their case against Charles Ng, the search for evidence continued at Leonard Lake's cabin. By this time, five bodies had been found and identified. Hundreds of personal effects had been recovered. More than 40 pounds of unidentifiable human remains had been unearthed. Investigators believe that as many as 25 missing persons had been linked to the cabin. As the evidence against Ng continued to grow, he used his time in a Canadian prison to try to fend off any attempts at extradition. He knew if he was successfully extradited back to the United States, he would have to face a murder trial and the possibility of the death penalty. He began to educate himself on the American legal system. For a boy with limited education raised in Hong Kong, he was remarkably adept at knowing the, the legal system here and how to deal with it. A guard reported to the prison warden, he overheard Ng say to a fellow inmate, if you want to delay the system, you just have to fire your lawyers. On October 17, 1988, the extradition hearings finally began. Ng lost the case and appealed all the way to the Canadian Supreme Court. His appeal was denied. Within the same day, he, Charles Ng was placed on an airplane in Canada and flown back to California. But the pursuit of justice was far from over. Charles Ng had used his time in Canada to arm himself with enough legal knowledge to wage an all-out war on the American judicial system. On September 26, 1991, suspected serial killer Charles Ng was finally returned to California. The Calaveras County District Attorney charged Ng with 12 counts of murder. Detective Sergeant Randy Grassmuck transported Ng daily from the California Department of Corrections to the Calaveras County Courthouse. We had high security, we had our SWAT team up on the roof for a while. Uh, we had heard that, that somebody wanted to kill Charles Ng. But let's face it, the last thing we wanted to do as Calaveras County Sheriff's Department was lose Charles Ng. Calaveras County was not prepared to handle a prisoner like Charles Ng. Their courthouse wasn't secure enough to hold a maximum security prisoner. The county had to build a special cage to house Ng during his legal proceedings. From the moment Ng arrived in the county, he was intent on wreaking havoc and creating delay. He began by trying to fire his attorneys and complaining about his treatment. He filed motions for better food, and a shorter commute from the prison. He demanded to have his cage dismantled. Although each motion was frivolous, it sapped the resources of the Calaveras County District Attorney's Office. I didn't realize how truly huge this case was. We're very small. I, we have five attorneys, uh, including myself. There's the assistant district attorney, and then I have three deputy district attorneys. We have two investigators, and we have three support staff, and that's it in our criminal division. Um, uh, it's like a very small law firm. The prosecution battled Charles Ng for a full year before his preliminary hearing even started. Your Honor, at this point in time, we would like to present photos, affidavits and videotapes into evidence against the defendant. The purpose of this proceeding was simply to determine whether we the prosecution had sufficient evidence to try for the 12 the murders. Case against the defendant moving forward to trial. Although the burden of proof is not as strict as that of an actual trial, the prosecution had little direct evidence linking Ng to the murders. Lacking eyewitnesses, fingerprints, and blood evidence, 
the prosecution would have to present its case mostly on circumstantial evidence. Their strongest evidence was the videotape found at the cabin entitled M Ladies. The preliminary hearing was the first time the tape was played for the public. On the tape, Lake and Ng were seen torturing two women, one of whom was Brenda O'Connor. Inspector Erdelatz explains the impact of the videotaped evidence. Brenda O'Connor is a woman who lived on the adjacent property with her boyfriend and his friend and their little baby. And you see her on film, she's handcuffed and she's begging Leonard Lake and Charles Ng for her baby back. She wants her baby back and she's crying. Of course they killed this little baby and uh, uh, it's such a, a, a sad thing to see uh, her asking for this little baby back. The tapes were incriminating, but with so little physical evidence directly linking Ng to the murders, the prosecution would have to rely on the testimony of another criminal. Hey, Maurice Laberge had served time with Ng in Canada. To pass the time, Ng entertained Laberge with crudely drawn cartoons depicting his crimes and with stories of what had happened at Lake's cabin in California. To gain favor with his parole board, Laberge turned over the cartoons and told authorities the details of his conversations with Ng. One of the most damning cartoons depicted Ng killing a baby. Laberge testified at Ng's extradition hearing, detailing everything Ng had confessed during their jail time together. Laberge's testimony was presented as evidence. On November 13, 1992, the court found sufficient grounds to try Charles Ng on 12 counts of murder. The judge set his trial date for January 12, 1993. We felt that the case would be tried and, and over with uh, by 93, but no later than 1994. Well, that didn't happen. Um, what did happen was delay. Now that Ng knew he would stand trial for his crimes, he began a desperate attempt to delay the proceedings in any way possible. He filed a motion alleging that his court-appointed attorneys were incompetent. He succeeded in firing them, and the court appointed him new counsel. Because pre-trial publicity made it impossible to find an impartial jury in Calaveras County, Ng's new defense team filed a motion to move the trial. The judge granted the motion, moving the trial to Orange County in Southern California. A fully loaded 36-foot truck delivered a mountain of case material to Ng's new counsel, the Orange County Public Defender's Office. The material included hundreds of boxes of records documenting eight years of courtroom hearings, witness testimony, investigative, medical, and police reports, and thousands of evidence photographs. William Kelly, Ng's newly appointed counsel, asked for and received two and a half years to prepare his client's case. The prosecution made the move from Calaveras County, 400 miles south, to Orange County and prepared for the largest case of their careers. The years of delay worried prosecutor Peter Smith. As you know, in, in any case, uh, memories fade, witnesses die, things of that nature. And so when you tack on six years um, to the life of a criminal case, that's a long time to delay a case uh, from going to trial. Good morning, gentlemen. Have a seat. Good morning, sir. As the prosecution and defense attorneys finalized their trial preparations, Ng again attempted to delay the process. But Judge John Ryan put a stop to his tactics. The case was finally going to trial. 
A prosecution team from Calaveras County worked out their strategy with Charlene Honaka, the deputy attorney general for the state of California. Yes, I know. She's a tremendous lawyer and a, a, a better person. She was, in essence, the heart and soul for, uh, for this case and for the prosecution. As prosecutors prepared to begin jury selection, the team suffered a devastating setback. Maurice LaBerge was killed in a car accident while on parole. He was the only person to whom Ng had confessed his crimes. The prosecution had just lost its key witness. Thirteen years had passed since investigators began finding bodies at a mountain cabin in Calaveras County, California. Although they eventually linked 25 missing people to Lake's property, they only had enough evidence to charge Charles Ng with 12 counts of murder. Ng had managed to delay his trial for more than a decade, but could delay no longer. The murder trial of Charles Ng was finally about to begin. The accused serial killer's fate would now rest with a jury of his peers. Peter Smith's job was to select that jury. Because the case was going to take so long, we had to time qualify jurors. We had to bring in over 2,000 people from Orange County to ask them basically, can you commit to the time it is, it'll take uh, to try this case? While counsel was in the midst of qualifying the jurors, Ng grew agitated. Shouting obscenities, he tried to halt the proceedings, telling the judge that he did not want a trial. Judge Ryan ordered Ng to wear an electric stun belt for the duration of the trial. The bailiff could trigger the device by remote control if he became violent again. Attorneys from the prosecution and the defense took a month to choose a jury of eight women and four men, along with six alternates. To protect their identities, each member of the jury was assigned a number. On Monday, October 26, 1998, the trial began with opening statements. For both the prosecution and the defense, opening statements serve as an outline telling the jury what they are trying to prove and how they intend to prove it. With the years of waiting over, Charlene Honaka rose to make the opening statement for the prosecution. What the evidence in this case is going to show is that this defendant, with Leonard Lake, planned and committed the 12 charged murders in this case. This is a chart which lists the 12 counts. The evidence will show that between a time frame from July 1984 until 1985, these 12 victims disappeared from the face of the earth. And this trial will tell you the story of what happened to them. Onaka described the property in Calaveras County as a killing field and a mass graveyard. Connecting this defendant she then told the jury about the M ladies tape found buried near the cabin and how they depicted a partially nude Ng demanding massages from Kathleen Allen and cutting the clothes off of Brenda O'Connor. We're going to play for you two segments from that videotape as a means of demonstrating the evidence and in helping you understand. The videotape was the centerpiece of the prosecution's case. It showed the jury exactly who Charles Ng was, a man who not only tortured women, but who recorded his acts on videotape so he could relive them again and again. The videotape's dramatic. It is the most, uh, it is the most incriminating piece of evidence I've ever used in a case. Uh, it is also the most emotional piece of evidence I've ever used in a case. Uh, you can sense the terror and the, uh, uh, um, 
the fear those two victims had when they realized the situation they were in. Because this was the strongest physical evidence linking Ng to the murders, the prosecution planned to use the videotape throughout the trial to prove Charles Ng's guilt. William Kelly, Ng's court-appointed attorney, scarcely mentioned the defendant in much of his opening statement. His strategy was to shift the focus of the accusations from his client, Charles Ng, to the late Leonard Lake. The defense in this case is really simple. That is, Leonard Lake had a motive for murder. Leonard Lake also had a plan for murder. Kelly asserted that Lake's plan for murder was outlined in his diary under the heading, The Miranda Project. He then read the jury excerpts from Leonard Lake's journal. Kelly suggested that Lake's conspirator was not Ng, but Clarilyn Balaz, Lake's ex-wife. He asserted that she knew about the Miranda Project and even recruited potential victims. Nobody's gonna walk in here Sit down in that jury box, point a finger at Charles Ng, and say, I saw Charlie Ng murder somebody. It's not going to happen. With very little physical evidence placing Ng at the murders, Kelly intended to discredit the prosecution's circumstantial case and prove it was Leonard Lake, not Charles Ng, who murdered the 12 victims. He asserted that Ng killed no one. The prosecution called Sergeant Larry Copeland of the Calaveras County Sheriff's Department to the stand. Can you tell us how long he told the jury about a startling discovery he made while analyzing the videotapes confiscated from Ng's San Francisco apartment. So I'd put this tape in and uh, push played, play, and it started with the credits. So I thought, well, gee whiz, someone didn't rewind this tape. So I pushed rewind, but I didn't push stop first. I just pushed rewind. So it started playing in reverse. And then all of a sudden, right at the end of the tape, it went Oop. What Copeland discovered was a still image of two bodies in a wheelbarrow. The image was entered into evidence. Is that correct? Yes, it is. The medical examiner was Would sworn you take in. A look at these photos for me? He was asked to identify two photographs of bodies found at the cabin. Yes, I believe that's the remains of Scott Stabley. Uh, and this next one? Uh, those remains are from um, Lonnie Bond. He went on hey, to explain like to the way in which Lonnie Bond and Scott Stabley were bound, gagged, and wrapped in sleeping bags. <laughs> the sleeping bags matched those on the tape. The medical examiner testified that the bodies on the tape were in full rigor mortis. Rigor mortis occurs shortly after death when the blood flow is interrupted. It only lasts for a few hours until the body begins to decay. In Canada, Ng told Inspector Ertelatz he helped bury Bond and Stapley 24 hours after they were murdered. Whoever had taken the picture had done so immediately after they were killed. The single frame on the videotape found at Ng's apartment linked him to the murder of Lonnie Bond and Scott Stapley. Because so few of the remains found on the property could be identified, the prosecution relied on hundreds of personal effects discovered at Ng's apartment and the cabin to link him to the victims. These items were photographed and entered as evidence. The district attorney's lead investigator, Mitch Hertlicka, was in charge of witnesses' testimony for the prosecution. Well, we had over 200 pieces of evidence that we used in the guilt phase of the trial, and we had about 75 witnesses that we had to bring in from various parts of the country as well as Canada to prove that those items belonged to the people who had gone missing and the victims in our case. The prosecution then attempted to establish a link between Kathleen Allen and Charles Ng. Kathleen Allen was one of the women on the M-Ladies tape who was tortured by Lake and Ng. 
Although her body was never found, several of her personal effects were unearthed near the cabin. The prosecution asked her sister to identify a heart-shaped pendant. Ms. Allen, I know this may be very difficult for you, but I want you to look very closely at this necklace and tell me if you recognize it. It's a necklace Kathy used to wear all the time. Thank you. Your Honor, we'd like the record to show that the witness identified the necklace as belonging to the victim, Kathy Allen. And at this time, the people would like to move that we place this in evidence. The prosecution then began to construct the timeline of Kathleen Allen's disappearance to explain how she got to the On cabin. April 14, 1985, Her former supervisor discussed an odd phone conversation she had while at work. Yes, sir, I did. And can you tell us about that conversation? Uh, yes, she said she got a call and she said she wanted to join her boyfriend because he got a gunshot wound. Kathleen Allen worked at a grocery store in Milpitas, California. Her boyfriend, Mike Carroll, had met Charles Ng while serving time in Leavenworth Federal Prison. Mike called Kathleen to say he was in Lake Tahoe and had been shot. He was sending a friend to pick her up and bring her to him. Kathleen told her supervisor what Mike had said and asked for some time off. Mm -hmm. And what happened after that? Uh, a man came by to pick her up. In a what? In a brown or bronze Honda, I think. Did you have an opportunity to see the driver? Uh, a little, a little, yes. Can you tell us what he looked like? He was in his 40s. Uh, bald, dark hair, and he had a beard. That's all I remember. The prosecution then showed the jury Kathleen Allen's videotaped ordeal. John Crawford investigated her disappearance. The videotape picks up from there and shows that Kathy is brought into the residence, into the living room of the residence in Wilseyville. Uh, she is handcuffed and she is seated in a chair. Kathy was told, if you don't agree with us right now, we're going to take you into the bedroom, tie you to the bed, you rape you, take you outside and put a bullet in your head and bury you in the same place we buried Mike, who was her boyfriend, Mike Carroll. Did you ever hear from her again? Kathleen was never seen or heard from again. Her manager later received a typewritten letter saying she had gotten a job in Lake Tahoe and didn't intend to return. The letter was dated May 6th, three weeks after she left the grocery store. Many of the victim's co-workers, families and friends received typewritten letters from the victims to explain their absence. A comparison of the letters showed they all originated from the same typewriter. An Olympia typewriter found in the cabin was analyzed by forensic document examiners. They concluded that it was the one on which the letters were written. The prosecution entered the typewriter into evidence. The prosecution next tried to prove that Charles Ng was responsible for the abduction and murder of the Dubs family. Ms. Tuck, you told us that your last contact with Deborah Dubs was... They called Karen Tuck, who was asked to testify about the last time she spoke with her friend Deborah Dubs on the telephone. Well, Deb was expecting someone to come over to talk to Harvey or see his video equipment. And then the doorbell rang, or someone knocked, and... We terminated the conversation. So someone came to her door while you were in the phone conversation with her? Right. Hi. Hi. We're here about the video equipment. Yeah. Harvey Dubbs, a part-time wedding yeah. photographer, had placed an ad in a newspaper offering to rent his video equipment. He's got a heavy-duty coax cable, too. Karen Tuck told the court she tried to call Deborah Dubbs the next day, but no one answered the phone. Dubs' family disappeared on July 25, 1984. Their bodies were never found.
was expecting someone to come over. Karen Tuck was the last person to speak with Deborah Dubbs on the day she and her family were abducted from their San Francisco home. Takes really good pictures. After placing an ad in the newspaper to rent some video equipment, Harvey Dubbs, his wife, Deborah, and his son Sean had been robbed and taken from their home. The family was never seen again. Detective Irene Brunn found an inventory of Harvey Dubb's equipment at his home. Harvey was meticulous in keeping records and photographs, and he kept the original receipts from when he purchased them. He had serial numbers, brand names for everything that he had. Harvey Dubb's detailed records enabled investigators to trace his equipment to Leonard Lake's cabin. But some video equipment was also found in Charles Ng's apartment. One of these pieces matched Harvey Dubb's inventory. The prosecution entered the video equipment into evidence. Since the Dubbs' bodies were never found, the prosecution's strategy was to use overwhelming circumstantial evidence to tie Ng to the missing family. A case is, is like a puzzle. You have to start putting the pieces together so that the jury can get a, a clear understanding of what took place. And to prove a case, you have to fit enough pieces of, of the puzzle together so that a, a jury believes beyond a reasonable doubt that a particular defendant murdered or committed a crime. And, and focused our attention on this bunker. Uh, Sergeant Larry Copeland was called back to the stand. Well, when we first came on... Uh, he testified about the seven burn sites they had found. Uh, there was a bit of he also described the hundreds of bone fragments he found, many of which had been crushed, burned, and scattered around the property. Judging from the size and number of burn sites, investigators suspected Lake and Ng had used fire to dispose of the bodies of many of their victims. The condition of the remains would make it impossible to identify all the victims. No one had witnessed any of these crimes, but the prosecution's next move was to put Ng's confessor on the stand. During his Canadian prison term, Ng told Maurice LaBerge he helped Lake abduct victims and burn their bodies. LaBerge was the prosecution's key witness. His first-person account and the drawings Ng gave him would cement their case. But LaBerge died before the trial began. At the extradition hearing in Canada, LaBerge testified about everything Ng had told him. In a calculated move, the prosecution argued to have the written transcripts of LaBerge's Canadian testimony read into the record. Despite the defense's strong objections, the judge ruled to admit the transcript. Sergeant Raymond Monroe, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Robbery, took the stand uh, and read LaBerge's prior testimony. The defendant in the transcript, well LaBerge described how Ng gave him the grotesque cartoons and spoke of the crimes he committed, including the videotaped sessions with Kathleen Allen and Brenda O'Connor. Following statement. <clears throat> He told me that the videotape shows a female complaining that it's too warm, and he had had a butterfly knife, he called it. He flicked it open and cut her clothes off. Thank you. Maurice LaBerge was a career criminal who served repeated terms for robbery and sexual assault. On cross, Kelly attacked LaBerge's credibility. Isn't it true that Maurice LaBerge had an extensive criminal history? Objection, Your Honor. We've already established that. Overruled. Thank you. Sir, isn't that correct? Yes, sir. And isn't it also true that as part of an agreement with the Canadian government to enter the witness protection program that Maurice LaBerge received $36,000? I believe that was the deal that we struck with him, yes. Kelly implied that LaBerge's testimony had been bought and paid for. Sexual assault and robbery? Yes, it is. And do you recall offhand what, if any, contents were uh, retrieved from the automobile at the site of the accident? 
There was $20,000 in cash found in the vehicle. $20,000 in cash? Kelly's cross-examination had been successful in insinuating that LaBerge would say anything for money. You're a career police officer. Although the prosecution's correct? key witness yes, had taken the stand by proxy, yes, they now feared the defense attack had destroyed his credibility. Isn't it true? Sergeant Monroe was one of the prosecution's the last LaBerge witnesses. Numerous convictions After presenting their case for 12 days, That's the correct. prosecution rested. On November 17, 1998, William Kelly began presenting Ng's defense to the jury. He had a relatively simple strategy to prove that Leonard Lake was the real killer and Ng was just a bystander. First, Kelly called a series of women to the stand. Each Colleen testified Kelly. as to their bizarre sexual encounters with Leonard Lake. The women spoke of his interest in bondage and taking lurid photographs. One woman had a year-long relationship with Lake and posed for dozens of photos. She explained she left him because of his frightening fantasies involving sex and death. So that would have been 15 years ago? Another woman testified that Lake had threatened to rape her um, and that he, he believed in human sacrifice. The testimony painted Lake as the monster and established that none of the witnesses had even Witness met Charles Ng. Thank you. Another witness testified that he had seen Lake verbally abuse Ng. Working as a sort of his assistant or helper. Helping the defense establish that Ng was subservient to Lake. By calling witnesses who had often seen Balaz with Lake at the cabin, in most, in the defense cases, attempted to show that Balaz herself was an accomplice to Lake. Kelly also used this testimony to demonstrate that Ng spent little time at Leonard Lake's cabin. The defense's strongest proof that Lake planned to kidnap, torture, and murder his victims was his journal. It was here that Lake outlined the so-called Miranda Project. While the jury was out, Kelly moved to enter an edited version of the journal into evidence. Because the edited version eliminated references to Charles Ng, the judge resisted. I believe the court should eliminate misleading evidence. And this edited diary could do just that if it is intended to show that Leonard Lake killed all 12 victims without the help of Charles Ng. I believe the diary needs to be excluded. Most of it is just pure junk. But the diary shows that Lake was thinking of the fantasy for 20 years. The jury knows what Lake planned. This edited diary is inadmissible. Kelly's attempt to put Leonard Lake on trial appeared blocked. But he countered the prosecution's strategy with his next witness. In his opening statement, Kelly asserted Clarilyn Balaz knew of the Miranda Project and helped Lake recruit women to photograph. Kelly believed she played a far more active role than she admitted and asserted it was Balaz, not Ng, who was Lake's accomplice. The prosecution had not called her as a witness, so as Balaz took the stand, everyone in the courtroom, including the prosecution, wondered what she would say. Then Kelly read the immunity agreement. I'll read it to the jury. This is an immunity agreement between the state of California and Clara Lynn Balaz. The state of California promises witness transactional immunity for all crimes, including, but not limited to murder, conspiracy to commit murder, aiding and abetting murder, theft and received stolen property related to the victims. No questions. In a stunning move, Kelly chose not to question Balaz. He created the appearance she had something to hide. And since she had not spoken on the stand, 
the prosecution could not cross-examine her. The laws made her immunity deal with the prosecution, but in the end, she provided them with little information and became a witness for the defense. Kelly then called another witness who could not be cross-examined. He played a tape made by Leonard Lake describing his rationale for the Miranda Project. What I want is an off-the-shelf sex partner. I want to be able to use a woman whenever and however I want. And when I'm tired or satiated or bored or not interested, I simply want to put her away. With a final glimpse into the mind of Leonard Lake, the defense rested its case. Peter Smith made the final closing argument for the prosecution. He reminded the jury of the evidence they had seen and asked them to return a guilty verdict. Then the trial took its most surprising turn. After hearing the prosecution sum up their case against him, Ng filed a handwritten motion demanding he be allowed to testify on his own behalf. When Kelly tried to convince his client otherwise, Ng threatened to fire him. Against the advice of his attorneys, Charles Ng would be taking the witness stand. Observers in the Charles Ng trial were stunned when they entered the courtroom on January 27, 1999. The accused serial killer himself was now on the witness stand. Ng was charged with killing 12 people, and after three months of listening to his case, he demanded to testify on his own behalf. Assuming the prosecution would use LaBerge's testimony to corner Ng, Deputy Public Defender Clapp decided to take the offensive and prove that LaBerge had lied. Did you tell him that, with regard to Brenda O'Connor, Kathy Allen, that you shot them in the head while they were handcuffed and blindfolded? No. Ng testified that he had helped to imprison Brenda O'Connor and Kathleen Allen, but had not intended to hurt or kill them. Did you tell Maurice LaBerge that um, you put their bodies on a pile of wood and ignited it with gasoline? No. Did you agree to kill, intend to kill, or kill any of the victims in the 12 murder charges? No. King's denials and continued for hours as Clapp went over every statement Ng allegedly made to his jailmate. That we gave the then Clapp moved to have Ng explain away the prosecution's other key evidence, the M Ladies tape. On the tape, Brenda O'Connor begged Ng not to take her baby away. With regard to, the video to which he replied, It is better than the baby is dead. Why did you say that? I don't know why I said that. It was just in the heat of the moment. Some of the comments and remarks I made, I don't even know I made until I saw the transcripts. The M Ladies tapes had been transcribed during the extradition hearing so that every word spoken on the tape could be understood. When Charlene Honaka cross examined Ng, she used the transcripts to turn his own words against him. Were you present at the extradition hearing? when Mr. LaBerge testified that you told him that you could hear on the video the sounds of handcuffs clicking? I remember that statement he made. Now, how would Mr. LaBerge know that you could hear the sounds of handcuffs clicking? I mean, that's not on the printed transcript, right, of them ladies? Right. Onaka demonstrated for the jury that the only way LaBerge could have known about the sound of the handcuffs was if Ng told him. Mr. Ng. It was clear, despite Ng's denials on the stand, that he had told Maurice LaBerge the details of the torture and the killings. Details LaBerge couldn't have known any other way. Onaka then set out to establish that Charles Ng was not a bystander, but a willing participant in the crimes. She replayed a scene from the M Ladies tape, showing Ng cutting the shirt off Brenda O'Connor. 
So you never talked to Leonard ahead of time about your plan to cut her clothes off, right? No, not on the tape. So you just decided on your own to cut her clothes off, right? Yes. Without any specific instruction from Leonard Lake. Onaka again turned to the videotapes. She played a portion of the tape where Ng tells Leonard Lake that a gun is on the table. You told Leonard at one point that the piece was on the table, right? Yeah, I remember saying something like that. What did you mean by the piece? Oh, just wanted to let him know the gun was on the table in case Kathy might grab the gun and shoot him with it. Well, now, she's handcuffed, right? Yes. And she's got leg manacles on? Yes, I believe so. And there are two of you and one of her, right? Yes. <laughs> and the reason you told Leonard that the gun was on the table is because you were afraid Kathy might pick it up and shoot him? Mm, something like that. Onaka had shown that Ng was more than a bystander to Leonard Lake's crimes. Thank you. He was an active participant who sometimes even directed Leonard Lake. Because Ng took the stand after the prosecution closed, the judge gave them the opportunity to restate their closing arguments after Ng's testimony. It's never Ng's fault. He always lays the blame on someone else. He was not under the control of Leonard Lake. He was his own person. He was making his own independent choices and doing the things he wanted to do. William Kelly then gave the closing arguments for the defense. He asserted the prosecution had simply failed to prove their case and attacked their most important piece of evidence, the M Ladies tape. No matter how many different ways they show it to you and excerpts from it, there's one thing you never see. Anybody being murdered. And you don't see Charles Eng involved in anybody's murder. No matter how many times you see him cut the clothes off Brenda O'Connor. And as offensive as that is, and I grant you it's offensive. But it ain't murder. It just isn't. Charles Ng had been charged with the murders of seven men, three women, and two babies. His fate was now in the hands of the jury. Anybody who prosecutes cases or tries cases knows there's never a sure thing with a jury. And that's the difficult aspect of being a prosecutor. You have to convince 12 people beyond a reasonable doubt. And they all 12 have to agree. It has to be unanimous. The jury deliberated for a week, then two weeks. The media coverage intensified as the deliberations stretched into their third week. The prosecutors became increasingly concerned that the jury was having difficulty making a decision. This was not a good sign for the prosecution, who knew their case was mostly circumstantial. It's cases or tries cases, knows there's never a sure thing with the jury. And that's the difficult aspect of being a prosecutor. You have to convince 12 people beyond a reasonable doubt. And they all 12 have to agree. It has to be unanimous. The jury deliberated for a week, then two weeks. The media coverage intensified as the deliberations stretched into their third week. The prosecutors became increasingly concerned that the jury was having difficulty making a decision. This was not a good sign for the prosecution, who knew their case was mostly circumstantial. If the jury demanded strong physical evidence linking Ng to the crimes in order to deliver a guilty verdict, then Charles Ng might go free. As time dragged on, all the prosecution could do was wait. A 
On February 24, 1999, after three weeks of waiting, the jury informed the judge they had reached a decision. The prosecutors had called approximately 75 witnesses and presented about 200 pieces of evidence to prove the charges against Charles Ng. All that evidence was now in the hands of the jury. As the jury reached its verdict, we are deadlocked. We are deadlocked on one count. Would the defendant rise and face the jury, please? Read your verdict. We, the jury, in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Charles Ng, guilty of the murder of Sean Dobbs as charged in count one. The jury found Charles Ng guilty of 11 counts of first-degree murder. They could not come to a conclusion on the death of the Paul Cosner. They did not feel they had enough evidence to convict. Charles Ng was sentenced to death. For the prosecution, the long ordeal was finally over. And I was just happy for the people of Calaveras County that finally um, Mr. Ng was found guilty of these murders after so many years. I'm proud uh, of the fact that uh, I was the district attorney at the time and, and prosecuted Charles Ng, and I was, in essence, the last person standing from Calaveras County after all these years. With a final cost of over $20 million, the longest and most expensive criminal case in California history came to a close. For 13 years, the prosecution never wavered in their pursuit of justice. Charles Ng now sits on California's death row.